sad really because Roger and Pam and the kids were the most Christian family that I have ever met. They were always happy, they do anything for anybody. They were just lovely and they lived for the brethren and in my opinion, the brethren killed them. The great buildings of the established church stand witness to the continuing traditions of a national faith. Their invitation to worship is always there, and though they're often empty, they're always open. But there are people living around us who profess the same faith, who worship the same God, but who do so in secret. They meet to sing hymns and read the Bible in buildings that look more like fortified barracks than houses of prayer. They worship the man who touched lepers by screening themselves off from the contagion of the everyday world. They don't identify themselves, they extend no invitation. The only window in this meeting house is the one to read the gas meter. At the present time, there are over 200 buildings like this in different parts of the country, and more are going up. Like this one in Worthing, just outside the back door of pensioner Mrs. Roseanne McKnight. What does she know about who owns it or what it's for? Well, absolutely nothing at all. We've um, heard nothing of what they are or what they're going to do, and uh, the only uh, information we have is what we read in the papers that they're a non-denominational sect. And uh, we really were, were a bit, are a bit worried about it because we don't actually know. And a building without windows now is a bit more. A building without windows? Yeah, it's more dubious, isn't it? But, but can't you find out who it is? Well, no, because you never get anywhere. You go to uh, inquire anywhere. It's always more sacred of it gets. We just say, well, it's a non-denominational sect. Yeah. So what is that? I mean, it, it must be something with a name, but yeah. they never give it one. Opposite another unmarked meeting house in Northampton is the vicarage of the Reverend Simon Delves Broughton, who knows the name of the people who go there, but little else. Um, I see members of the of the exclusive brethren arriving every Sunday morning early, uh, several uh, evenings in the week. Um, I have tried to smile at them across the fence, but um, I usually receive a rather stony stare in return. Stories like this have been emerging recently from all over the country. Churches being built without windows, surrounded by high wire fences like this one, or even by barbed wire. Families being broken up. So who are these people? Well, the record books show that their name is the Exclusive Brethren, and the records books show little else, because the Exclusive Brethren, in contrast to most churches, prefer to keep themselves very much to themselves. Just why are they so secretive? Why do they prefer to keep from their neighbors what goes on behind these walls? And all these stories we keep hearing about them, are they just the run-of-the-mill rumours that any group which tries to withdraw and worship in privacy attracts to itself? Or are the activities of the exclusive Brethren sect something that should be made more public? Something which might make us think very seriously about the effects of the freedom of worship we so much value in this country. We went to Andover to talk to the Brethren there. Not in here. Right. Well, we won't say nothing at all to you and we never will. We won't talk to you and we never will, was the instant reaction of these brethren. But one person from the Andover group who did agree to talk to us is Glynis Ward, a 22-year-old nurse on sick leave from hospital with an injured arm. And she can speak only because she's an outcast from the sect. Glynis was born into the exclusive brethren. Her whole family were devout followers. Childhood in a Brethren family was happy for Glynis, and until three years ago, her life was ruled by the Brethren's strict teachings, almost daily prayer meetings, and a social life confined to the sect. Her happiness ended the day that her parents, themselves lifelong members of the sect, broke just one of the rules. They just clapped down on Mum and Dad all week. They never left them alone. They were around every night. They wouldn't let them go out to the meetings. And they were just on top of them, saying that's wrong and you're wicked and... That was the, the devil to do that, and it's not right, and you're unclean, and you've made your house unclean, and they just kept on and on and on. They were just told that they were excommunicated, and I just had to watch them walk out of church, knowing that I couldn't speak to them, couldn't write to them, couldn't ring them, couldn't say hello to them, couldn't send them presents, couldn't do anything. I'd never see them again. My brother took me round to my parents' house, 
and he didn't speak to my mother or father. My mother and father stood at the back door and I went in and I just stood with them. And all I could do was cry and mum and dad would cry. And my brother just walked upstairs into my bedroom and cleared my bedroom and put it in the back of his car, took everything as if I'd never lived there. But what was this terrible thing that your parents had done, so terrible that they had to be excommunicated for it? Well, they were excommunicated because my mother let the next door neighbour into the house. She only came inside the back door to see my little nephew because he was only six weeks old and it was too cold to go outside. <clears throat> and they, she just simply asked, as anybody would do, can I see the baby? But what was wrong with the next door neighbour? Nothing was wrong with the next door neighbour. It was just a thing that you're not allowed to do, have unbelievers into your house. You see? I mean, it's just one of their rules that you're not allowed to have unbelievers into your house. You can't have a cup of tea with them. You can't eat with them. You can't... You mustn't have anything to do with them whatsoever. And they are the church. And who, if you don't go to that church, you don't believe or you don't belong, then you're not a Christian and you're unclean. And because your mother allowed an unclean person, unclean in their eyes... She made our house unclean. And therefore, we are unclean for allowing it. But who told them? How did the brethren find out? My brother. See, once my brother got married, he, he, um, they helped him with a mortgage and they helped him get a house and he's tied into it and I can't see that he'll ever be out. There's somebody up the top saying, you do this and you do that and you don't do this and you don't do that. And it's brainwashing. And you do get a fear. I was very, very frightened. I mean, I was frightened to walk around the streets in case I bumped into mum when I was taken away from home. Because if I had spoken to her, I was terrified in case some of the other brethren saw me. But what could they have done to you if they'd seen you? What made you so frightened? Well, they would have had me up in front of everybody in the church and asked me why I had done this. And if I couldn't answer, they'd say, well, you better get right and they could possibly shut me up or... What does that mean? Well, ban me from going to church until I got right and confess that I did do wrong. They'd either do that in front of everybody or they excommunicate from me. It's not surprising that it took Glynis ten months to find the courage to reject the brethren. But she had to leave behind her only brother, Alan, and his family as the price of returning home to her parents. Glynis left two years ago. Is Alan still with the brethren? Yeah. Yes, he's still there. I haven't seen him for, must be a good two years now, and I haven't seen the children either. I did bring him must be good two years ago now. I did ring him and he said, I said, hello Alan, it's Glenys. He said, I can't talk to you, Glenys. He said, not after what you've done. And slammed the phone down on me. And so just a few weeks before her 21st birthday, Glenys had a late start in learning to appreciate life in a normal world. I can go into a coffee bar and have a cup of coffee. I can go to the pictures. I can watch television. I can wear trousers. I can wear a bikini. I can go and speak to anybody I want to, meet anybody I like. I can wear makeup. I can wear my hair short. I mean, my hair always used to be long. It's to wear, I can wear fashionable clothes. I can go on holiday abroad. I can go and stay in a hotel. I can go to a restaurant for a meal. I can have, have a cigarette if I want to. I can listen to radio, have a record player. Um, go to discos, go out to dinner. My job. I do all those things I've never been allowed to do before. But these are just ordinary things. <laughs> They're not ordinary to me. How does a religious group get itself into the position where the ordinary things of life are forbidden? To find the answer, we have to go to Dublin, where at this house in Fitzwilliam Square, early meetings of Christians disillusioned with the established churches were held. They felt that empty ritual and the outward shows of worship had replaced true spiritual feeling, that the hierarchy of the priesthood stood between them and their God. They established a community of believers who met in houses like this, all equal in the sight of God, rejecting all ministry. Their services were simple, bread was broken, prayers said, Bible readings given, hymns chosen and announced by whoever felt the urge within him. In this unstructured atmosphere, the dominant personality rose to be regarded as group leader. John Nelson Darby was acknowledged by the Brethren, as they came to call themselves, as the first universal leader. He was a considerable scholar who translated the Bible into three languages and wrote 40 books of commentary. 
It was Darby who first established the primacy of the need for separation from evil, taking as his text Paul's letter to Timothy, in which men are compared to vessels of honour and dishonour, and the one enjoined to purge itself of the other. Inspired by this text, Darby led the exclusive brethren to a permanent split from the open or Plymouth brethren in 1848. The movement became worldwide, and James Taylor Sr. of New York consolidated the position of universal leader during the first half of this century. His son, James Taylor Jr., built it up to one of absolute power. The final scandals associated with James Taylor Jr. caused the most sensational split in the history of the Brethren. But his early days were a heady time for everybody, especially young men like company director Roger Stott, whose lifelong commitment to the Brethren was slackening until James Taylor Jr., re-emphasizing the doctrine of separation from evil, threw out the challenge to his followers, if you're not with me, you're against me. Roger Stott, then in his 20s at Cambridge University, heard the challenge, responded to it, and decided to go back into his home assembly at Brighton. Well, it became, it became uh, more difficult to be ambiguous. You know, one, one either had to commit oneself or, or get out. Uh, a lot of people were leaving, in fact, at that time. And I suppose I started off by being very uh, opposed to this strong teaching about separation. And then eventually um, decided it was right, and it became a bit of a crusade. The fact that it was being emphasised so much more, and there was this quite exciting emphasis on a community that was in fact purifying itself and separating from the world and from what they saw as erroneous in Christendom, uh, was very much something that one could commit oneself to. Before it had been a bit flabby and inconclusive. Now it was something that you could either accept or reject, something very clear-cut. And what? people people were suffering for it. They were losing their jobs. They were giving up professional associations and losing their jobs. They were giving up jobs that involved entertaining clients and so on. Um, this is why I said there was a spirit of a crusade. Apart from the, the family tensions that could be caused by withdrawal from the brethren, were there any, any more practical ties that people could have had? Oh, yes. Um, you see, there was an increasing emphasis on the desirability of brethren working for brethren, um, which was felt to be safer and obviously bringing you less into contact with worldly people, inverted commas. Um, so that there were a lot of cases that I knew of where people who had reservations, and that I know of now who have reservations, uh, simply have too many financial commitments within the brethren to be able to take the risk of uh, disagreeing with them. By commitments, I mean people who are working for brethren and would therefore lose their job if they left the fellowship. People who had, have got mortgages arranged by other wealthy brethren and who would lose those if they came out. I mean, I've, I've known of cases in the past and I know of cases at the present where that is so. So that for totally irrelevant reasons, they have to go on in a fellowship which they don't have any real sympathy for, um, simply because their job or their mortgage or their house, as well as family and parents and so on, are dependent upon it. This is a very, um, well, agonizing position for anybody to be in. You see, in talking about what they did, the corrective things they did, the disciplines they imposed, we're talking about one side of it only. The actual inside thing, the enjoyment of meetings and um, fellowship and friendship, um, was of a very high order. There was a great deal of warmth and enjoyment and, and excitement too, because there were some very eloquent teachers. Apart from James Taylor himself, um, there were a number of quite remarkable orators and teachers. And I look back to some of those weekends, you know, although you know, I deplore the waste of 10 or 12 years of my life, really, you know, from 21 to 33. I hate the fact that I had that out of my life and so much I could have done with it. But nevertheless, during that time, there were weekends and occasions when I really did enjoy myself. The enjoyment for many brethren came to an end when James Taylor Jr. made his final tour of Britain in 1970. Roger Stott was so concerned at what then took place that he made a record of events and had it printed for private circulation amongst the brethren. The Universal Leader's message this time contained some disturbingly personal interpretations of scripture. He kept talking in pseudo-spiritual terms about 
the women in John's Gospel and Luke's Gospel and how they ministered to him with their substance and so on. And all this was really a cover-up for the fact that he was just trying to fondle every woman in sight. He had, in fact, put out an edict earlier that, or a suggestion, if you like, that they shouldn't wear foundation garments. And it was quite obvious why. And they, um, all these people were queuing up to kiss him and sitting on his knee and so on and so forth. He was obviously out of control. It was a very sad spectacle. But we gave him the place, and he could do virtually what he liked with it. Bastard. <laughs> you here. What's your name? Son of a bitch. John Gaskin. Get up. <laughs> you look like nothing. <laughs> Sit down. Why don't you bring some toilet paper with you? <laughs> I couldn't prove that you're a son of a bitch. I couldn't do that. Because you can't say a son of a bitch if you don't know. But you're a bastard. Well, there was no theme. It was just a, a complete jumble. He was using a lot of very strong words. Um, you know, not strong by the standards of the man in the street, but strong in, in terms of, of um, what Brethren had ever been used to. You know, he was calling people bastards and uh, saying, what the hell are we doing here, which was a kind of pun between the word hell, what the hell are we doing here, and the word hell, which was the name of God. Um, so by any standards, it was at least bordering on blasphemy. And then later, he was back in the house. He was staying with um, a man named James Alec Gardner is near Aberdeen and he was getting a little bit concerned about the fact that he had another couple staying in the house and the wife um, it was Bruce Kerr and his wife whose name was Madeline Madeline Kerr was um, had some nursing experience and was looking <coughs> looking after mr. Taylor nobody quite knew why um, there was something wrong with his foot or back or something and she seemed to be spending a lot of time going to his bedroom and you know James Alec Gardner was, was somewhat concerned. And this particular evening, on the Saturday, um, she'd been in there for a long time, so he felt he had to do something about it, particularly in view of this growing salacious element in Mr. Taylor's teaching and private conversation. So he asked um, uh, Stanley McCallum, who was quite a well-known Brethren leader, uh, who was also in Aberdeen and staying at a nearby house to come round and the two of them went and knocked on the door and went in and found Madeleine Kerr undressed in bed with Mr. Taylor. Um, and that is what happened at Aberdeen. Now the way it was presented by his followers was that in fact there was nothing immoral in what happened. She had undressed and she was lying on the bed with him but there'd been nothing improper and he in fact had engineered this whole incident in order to test who was really following him and who wasn't. Uh, in other words, those of us who were following him merely mentally and hadn't got a real vital link with him would fall into the trap and shout scandal and drop his teachings and disown him. Those who were really committed to him um, would see that it was only something that he'd engineered to expose those who weren't, and everybody would be happy. Uh, and from that point of view, that's precisely what happened. 8,000 people left, a fellowship of about 39,000. And the other 31,000 continued quite happily, saying that we'd all been caught by the trap. It was even, they even went as far as to say that he had, the Lord had told him to do this, and he had protested and gone on for weeks, saying that he couldn't do it, I can't do it, Lord. But in the end, he'd given in and done it, and it had had the result that the Lord had meant, and the 8,000 who were referred to as the rubbish were cleared out. James Taylor, Jr. died shortly afterwards, but his doctrines live on. Roger Paynes, the man who excommunicated Glynis Ward's parents, rose to be leader of the Andover group, but he was suddenly to fall from favour. Glynis was very close to the family. Something must have gone wrong. He must have done something wrong or said something wrong because they were down on him like a ton of bricks. They were just pounding him. They separated him from his family. They, I mean, by shutting up, they mean that you can't go out to church. You can't go out. You have to stay on your own and get right before God. That's how they put it. 
and he was separated from his family. He couldn't eat with his family. He couldn't sleep with his wife. He had to stay in the back room of his own house on his own. And he must have done this for a good three months, not having anything to do with his family, apart from the fact his wife and children couldn't go out to church because they were coming from an unclean house. He couldn't speak to his children, apart from saying goodbye as they went to school. And the whole purpose of this was they were, supposed, they were trying to make him see that he'd done something wrong and get right. Now, after three months, I can quite see that after three months, he knew that he'd be separated from his wife for good, that he'd never be allowed back into that church, or he'd be separated from them for a good year. He'd be excommunicated. And he'd have to leave the house so that pa Pamela, his wife, and the children could go out to the meetings. And he wouldn't be able to live with his wife. It was just like a divorce, really, being forced upon him. And he knew that this was going to happen. And rather, I mean, he was a superman. I mean, the kids were angels. You wouldn't, you know, he'd never smack them, never. And you never, you always see a smile on both their faces. They're always happy. You know, really sort of, fair enough, they were really deep into the church, but they were super people. Fantastic. And the kids were little angels as well. And so polite and everything. And he knew that he was going to be separated from them, so he took his, his wife and his family with him. So they couldn't what, be separated. What, what do you mean he took his wife and his family with him? Well, he killed them, three children and his wife, and then hung himself. The tragedy of the Paynes family made headline news at the time. But six months later, more sober accounts of it, together with other reports of suffering and distress allegedly caused by the doctrine practiced by the exclusive brethren, poured into the chambers of a leading QC in Lincoln's Inn Fields, who was appointed by the charity commissioners to investigate their affairs. Hugh Elvett Francis was given a unique opportunity to hear the Brethren's case when they applied for status as a charitable body, and he had the duty of examining their suitability for this. Having spent over a year considering the mounds of evidence from all parts of the country and weighing it against the explanations provided by the Brethren, Hugh Francis prepared a confidential report. What were its conclusions? Well, the conclusion I came to was that the doctrine of separation from evil, as um, interpreted and applied under the teachings of James Taylor, Jr., uh, was detrimental to the true interests of the community. And it is my view that a meeting house or room which adopts those teachings does not qualify as a charity because it is an overriding requirement of every charity that its purposes are beneficial to the community. As someone, Mr. Francis, who is no stranger to human delinquency, what were your personal reactions to this body of evidence which appeared before you? Well, my personal reaction was one of shock and disbelief. Um, I am a Christian myself, and I have always understood uh, that um, basic requirement um, <clears throat> for a Christian is to love his neighbors whether they are believers or not. And I was appalled that a sect professing to be a Christian sect, uh, should <coughs> adopt uh, teachings which were calculated uh, to cause so much distress and unhappiness among deeply religious people in their own families and in their personal relations uh, with friends and relatives. And there is no doubt in your mind that these are not perversions, but are the central teachings of the sect? Oh, I think that um, <clears throat> under the guidance, or rather the misguidance, of James Taylor, Jr. and his uh, fanatical supporters, 
uh, they formed the kernel of their religion. And that is why, in my view, it's so dangerous and why it is so detrimental and why it cannot be regarded as charitable to pursue activities of that kind. But they were given, were they not, an opportunity to explain to you the reasons for behaviour which you had decided was shocking and socially disruptive. What were those explanations? They did not, of course, deny um, the existence of these directives. They couldn't have done so. Um, they sought to justify them as um, proper interpretations of this doctrine. Um, they did not deny the um, directive that eating is fellowship. They seek to justify that. They acknowledge that it leads to sufferings within families, but they say that um, um, Christ suffered, and, and those who follow Christ must be prepared to suffer. An eminent legal mind, used to considering evidence impartially and without undue emotion, was shocked by what he found out about the exclusive brethren. So shocked that even having heard their side of the story, he made a ruling that the activities of the brethren operated to disrupt family ties and cause widespread distress and alarm. But his ruling, of course, does no more than prevent them getting certain tax benefits. It will not slow the impetus of their work. And how could it be otherwise in a society that's committed to religious freedom? We have given the brethren the right to reply. They haven't chosen to exercise it. And in the meantime, the tragedies go on. Like the story of bank official James Christie, who, after trying out other religious sects, chose the exclusive brethren at the age of 17. He rose to be unofficial head of his community in the north of England, and he chose to stay with the brethren even after the Aberdeen incident, accepting the word of the universal leader as gospel. Things happened at Aberdeen which were questionable, but I spoke to him on the phone and he told me it was uh, all a pack of lies. He said, don't believe a word you hear. And therefore I made no further inquiry. I accepted his word absolutely. This was James Christie's meeting house. He was the most influential man in a large district. He became too popular and was felt to be a threat to the universal leader. When he visited his mother, who was out of fellowship, he was excommunicated. Now he's on the other side of the barbed wire living quietly in Leeds with his wife Stella and his two sons Ralph and Cedric who left with him three years ago. Trying to forget the days when he travelled the country and crossed the Atlantic preaching the word, trying to remember without too much pain their two sons left behind in the Brethren, Lance then 17 and Garth then 15. When did you first realise Stella that you weren't going to see our eldest boys again? Well. I think I realised pretty soon after that this happened, but what hit me was that I had a dream one night about the second boy. I dreamt that I was going along the road and I saw a motorcyclist by the side of a motorcycle and I went up to help him and I realised it was my second boy. And uh, I did what I could for him and then someone else came along and I said, Please, would you call a policeman or an ambulance? I said, this is my son, and I haven't seen him for two years. And then I started to cry, and I woke up, because I, was, I thought how sad it was that I hadn't seen my own child for two years. One of the teachings of um, Mr. Taylor, Jr., was that Christ was made sin on the cross and abandoned by the Father and consequently that if there is a relative who is going on in sin, he or she should be abandoned. What is instilled into them, I think, constantly is that uh, it is uh, the Lord's will that they are doing what they are, and they're doing it, they believe, in faithfulness to Christ. And of course, um, it is put to them that uh, that is the paramount thing. What so is so... Think it's the paramount thing? To serve Christ, I would say, is a paramount thing, but I think that there are several Christians and believers in all sorts of sects and denominations who are pleasing Christ, not just the brethren. I've learnt that since we left ourselves. But uh, our second boy is now married and has a house of his own, 
Uh, we know his address, but and we've seen the house, but we knew he was out when we went to look at it. Do you know his wife? We've never met his wife. We know of her. Sometimes I wonder when I see a young girl on the street with her head square and her hair down whether it's his wife, but I don't know. I'd love to meet her, of course. Do you think it would be right that you should? Oh, yes, of course. I would welcome her. I wrote to Garth last week and uh, told him that we'd welcome them both if he came to the house. But James sent a cheque to our eldest boy for his birthday, but uh, he returned the cheque and sent quite a nice letter and said that under the circumstances he didn't feel he could receive it. And do you really think now that, that you won't see him again? Well, I think that as they grow older, particularly the elder boy, because he isn't married, they might have some feelings of dissatisfaction and worry. And I have a feeling that possibly he might leave. I think the one that is married is more likely to stay. I mean, if people gain the impression that if they go out of fellowship, they go to hell, it tends to um, lead people to want to stay. Was this in your minds when you permitted your children to leave because you thought it might damage them seriously? No, not in my mind. It was in our, it was in our minds in the sense that uh, we thought uh, at the time that it may be preservative for them uh, to be there rather than to go nowhere. Had you known at the time you left what you know now, would you have insisted that your children came out with you? I would have, uh, yes, I would have insisted on them staying at home, yes. Although uh, I would think when they reached uh, 18, I would have given them the free option to have decided for themselves. Now you have two sons in the Brethren and two sons who are not. Mm -hmm. They're going to have very different lives. Mm -hmm. Which very is going to be the most secure? <laughs> Well, the ones with the brethren have got a certain uh, restricted security. Uh, but I think the ones who are not are going to have a fuller, a much fuller and a much more enjoyable life, and they certainly enjoy life at the moment. In an attempt to make that sort of life more accessible for those still trapped behind the fences and closed doors, James Christie went to see his cousin, Jill Knight. They hadn't met for over 15 years. He came to see me because of the kind of thing that he had had in his family. And uh, we established contact again. And of course, I've seen him quite a bit since. And I've heard from James what it's done to his particular family. The fact that he's cut off from his own sons. Uh, and I know too that uh, we had in our family the fact that uh, James was cut off from his own father and mother mm. and from the rest of the family. And it seems to me such a wicked thing that um, something calling itself a religion should actually separate, uh, you know, father from child, husband from wife. Mm. And uh, it, it's frightening, I think. Mm. Well, this is a... Jill Knight is a Conservative MP and is so alarmed by the Brethren's activities that she's looking into the possibility of using legislation against them. What's the first step? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? There's another church, an ordinary Church of England church, across the other side of the road. And there's this one here. Now, I wouldn't be able to attend a service in this one. I would be welcome in the one over the road. As a church, of course, any church is entitled to rate relief. It pays a much less burden in rates. Now, the church over the road undoubtedly applies for and I'm sure gets rate relief. I don't know whether this one does, but I know an awful lot of exclusive brethren meeting houses up and down the country have applied for and do get rate relief. Now, one of the conditions of this beneficence is that the doors must be open to all members of the public uh, for services uh, on meeting days, you know? Well, they aren't at all, they'll keep you out. Now, that means, really, that they're not entitled to the rate rebate that a lot of them are getting. And I'm checking on this with regard to meeting houses, uh, it, this one included, all over the country, because I think it is very probable they're getting money that they're not entitled to. Now, secondly, 
All sorts of dirty work can go on in dark corners. The way to stop it is very often to shine a, a spotlight of publicity on it. And this is what is beginning now to be done to the exclusive brethren. You see, people don't know what goes on here. They don't know, they've never heard that this is a so-called religion which separates families. And if they knew about it, and this is where the publicity comes in, they would not be nearly so ready to permit their money to give rate rebates, you see. You're obviously very personally concerned with this question. You are an MP. What are you going to do about it? Uh, uh, I can't see how you can have legislation to stop it. Uh, and yet here we have a situation where husband is torn from wife, quite literally torn from wife. Look at the situation with my cousin James. He's got two sons. He never sees. And he never sees them because of the influence of these people on those young men. And uh, I think that's dreadful. I've known cases and heard about them through James and through others, where um, firms, of course, you see now they operate with uh, exclusive brethren, really means that. I mean, firms operate uh, with all exclusive brethren in it. And if you're put out of the church, you're uh, out of your job, and if it happens to be your factory, then you're in difficulty there too, because the people probably won't want to work with you. There's all kinds of ramifications. The difficulty is to see what you do about it in cold, hard parliamentary legislation, because you really can't legislate for um, mind, you know, changing people's minds. Uh, after all, James's sons are technically free to go and see James and his wife Stella. But in real uh, cold terms, they have been brainwashed in an inhuman way to keep away from their own parents. And there must be hundreds of families in Britain today who've been chopped up and segregated by the work of these people. So it seems that little can be done now by legislation to prevent the brethren from practicing their doctrines. Even though there's plenty of evidence that these doctrines break up families and cause widespread anguish. This is the price that we have to pay for religious freedom for all. And you may very well consider that it's too high a price. But what about the ones that get away? What about those who lose husbands, wives, families, homes and jobs? and also a deeply felt religious faith. What is the future of the ones that go free? All my life I've had brainwashing. Um, this is right, this is wrong, and I've believed it. Since I've been out, I've made my own judgments about what is right and what is wrong. And I also feel that Christianity, I am a Christian, and Christianity is personal. It's not to be inflicted on anybody. I don't impose my feelings on you, and I don't expect anybody ever to do it to me again. I just get a feeling of freedom. I'm me. I'm nobody telling me what to do. I had a lot of guilt. When I started to smoke, I, I used to think to myself, now, you shouldn't be doing this. And then I thought to myself, well, why not? And then when I came nursing, I felt, oh, I shouldn't be doing this either. And then I thought, why not? I mean, well, I think nursing is the best thing anybody could do, quite honestly. And we weren't allowed to do that because we should be at the meetings when, you know, when we should be working and all that. Christianity will always be there. And I'll always be a Christian because I believe. But the fact that um, everything's being thrown at me is not there anymore. And therefore, I'm a, just a normal person. But...